My name is David Garman, and I am a uh, board member of the Borrego Valley Endowment Fund. And on behalf of the fund, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's presentations. <coughs> and uh, thank you, uh, Elaine, for okay. setting up the room and uh, preparing it for us today. And you know, I feel any meeting that we have in this room, we would be remiss in not remembering Audrey Steele Bernan whose vision and generosity made this incredible facility possible. Um, and also I'd like to recognize there are several other uh, board members from the endowment fund who are here this afternoon. I'd like to ask them to stand up if they will. So Bruce Kelly. I'm not going to go through everybody's name, but these are people that if you have questions about the fund or its activity, uh, we all are certainly available to uh, answer any questions. So as many of you know, the, the fund began its existence just over 20 years ago as the Borrego Healthcare Society. And during the majority of those 20 years, it focused solely on the provision of healthcare services in Borrego Springs. Three years ago, the Healthcare Society changed its name to the Borrego Valley Endowment Fund, and it, um, it also expanded its focus uh, to include a broader range of issues that are important to our community, one of which we're here to talk about today, um, air quality. The mission of the fund is to harness the power of philanthropy to create enduring community-wide benefit and in keeping with this mission, two years ago, the fund elected to support a proposal from researchers at the University of California, Irvine, to study the air quality of the Borrego Valley, which is obviously an issue of uh, concern to residents and visitors alike. In supporting this research, the fund catalyzed a synergistic effort that included the Borrego Water District, uh, which purchased the particulate matter measuring devices, which I'm calling nephilometers. I'm not sure, Charlie, that that's the right <laughs> word, but that's what I'm calling them. Um, and also included in the, this, well, that's better. Can you hear me better? Yes. <laughs> also included in this synergy uh, is the lab of Dr. Travis Huxman, who is the director of this facility. Dr. Huxman welcomed the placement of the nephilometers on his climate monitoring stations which are located throughout the valley. And these monitoring stations are the result of a quarter of a million dollar grant uh, that Dr. Huxman received from the National Science Foundation. So it's with this background in mind uh, that I'm pleased to introduce today's first uh, speaker. We have two speakers, uh, Dr. Charles Zinder. Uh, Dr. Zinder did his undergraduate work in physics at Harvard and then received his PhD in astrophysics, planetary, and atmospheric science from the University of Colorado Boulder. And he is currently a professor in the Department of Computer Science and Earth System Science at the University of California, Irvine. Dr. Zinder. We've already had one request to make the presentations that you'll see today available on the web, so we'll make sure that that information is, uh, is given to you, the location. Uh, but for now, please just enjoy what we've brought to, to share. That wasn't me. Okay, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't tell, that wasn't me. <laughs> Hello, I'm Charlie Zender. Uh, it's really uh, wonderful to come back to Borrego. This is the second year that we've been back to, to, uh, to meet the community, and to um, uh, tomorrow we'll be giving uh, a more formal or a, a different type of report. Uh, but today we want to open up to the community the results of our second year of study about the Borrego Spring uh, air quality issues that we've agreed to uh, to work on in partnership with the Boulder, I'm sorry, Borrego Valley Endowment Fund. So thanks for that support. 
The results that I will be talking about were conducted with Morgan. Uh, Morgan Gorris is the main speaker today. Uh, the main uh, talk will be after I give about a 15 minute presentation on a more regional or kind of high level view of broader air quality issues affecting the Borrego Valley and, and Salton Sea area. As you can see, its uh, focus today is on the effects of the shrinking Salton Sea. So that's what we'll be talking about for the first 15 minutes. It's not a, um, it's, uh, it's really not a decoupled problem from Borrego uh, Township's uh, air quality. Uh, but it's larger in scope uh, in terms of years into the future that we're looking, and it gives people, I think, an idea of, of how interconnected uh, what you're breathing is with, with places far and wide, far and wide being a few, uh, up to a few hundred kilometers from here. And Sagar Parajuli was a postdoc uh, who also received uh, some of the support that the Borrego Valley Endowment Fund uh, gave him UC Irvine, and he uh, was a co-author on this work about the uh, shrinking Salton Sea. So I think that sets the uh, that sets the schedule. I'll be talking on the larger uh, regional air quality issues that we see coming up in the next few decades, which are re really a large part of the motivation for, for focusing in, 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 at UC Irvine we're in the Department of Earth System Science, and system science, what does that mean? System science means we try and look for the coupling between different disciplines because that's how we move from research to mitigation strategies for air quality to actual applications on the ground. How can we uh, how can we help either in planning or in identifying causes of air quality issues? So we are a, uh, both a pure and an applied science department. We were here just, I think, uh, a little over two years ago uh, when we came up with our proposal. And uh, in three simple steps, the first year of our proposal was to assess uh, historical air quality trends in the area. We reported on that last year. There may be a bit of a recap uh, today uh, with Morgan. Then this year we've been focusing on modeling. So you perhaps have heard of air quality models, which are weather models that have little particulates uh, called aerosols and gases in them, like ozone, and so that's the only difference between a, a weather forecast and an air quality forecast. And so we're working very closely now with a particular model, uh, and Morgan will be showing results of, of our modeling of the Borrego uh, air quality. And then in the third year, what we're going to be doing for the next year, in other words, is trying to use this modeling tool as a, um, as, a, as a hypothetical framework to test well, where the, the worst uh, episodes of air quality are originating. So air is so nebulous, it's hard to tell where different uh, air quality events stem from, and models are great for that because you can turn on and off sources. And so this next year will be focused on what we call attribution. We're going to try and attribute some of the worst events, worst days of air quality in Borrego to where we think the uh, particulates are coming from. And uh, come back in a year if you're interested in our findings on that. So I'm going to start out by looking, uh, by asking the question, how much of, uh, how much might the changes in the salt and sea level that we expect and are very confident in expecting, uh, how much might they affect regional air quality 
generally in this region. So you have Borrego Springs on the left, and you have the Borrego Valley extending out to the right, and then Imperial Valley and, and Mexico beneath. This is our study domain. This is about the size of the region that we get uh, medium scale, uh, six hour air quality episodes could come from <coughs> virtually anywhere in this region. Okay, so that's the, the size of the domain that we're looking at. And what's happening in the Salton Sea, uh, as you probably know, better than I, is that, a, is that this inland sea that was accidentally formed, its, its level has been maintained by two contributors. One is runoff from irrigation, and that will continue and maintain the Salton Sea as a body of water indefinitely. However, the second source of water is a freshwater diversion from the Colorado River aqueduct, and that diversion was ended, was uh, legislated uh, to end January 1st this year uh, by the state of California in exchange for a quantitative settle settlement agreement with San Diego County. We're now shifting the water that did go into the Salton Sea and helped kind of buffer up its level um, to that water's now moving to uh, urban uses in San Diego. And so as a result, the curve you see here shows from 1985 on the left to, to really yesterday, almost, what we think uh, the Salton Sea level has been for the past 30 years or so. And you can see a period of relative stability in the 1980s and 90s, and then around the year 2000 in the middle of the plot, the top of the Salton Sea uh, sinks from 228 feet below sea level to 236 feet, so an eight foot drop in about 20 years. So keep that in mind when you look at this figure, which is the projected level of the Salton Sea. And here, the uh, lavender region in the center of the plot, the lavender region in the center of the plot shows the current time period, and it is now changing rapidly. So we went from a period of relative stability, we lost eight feet in about 20 years, and now we're accelerating in declines. We just entered this, this area, and that accelerated decline is due to the quantitative settlement agreement the QSA that I mentioned earlier, because we're no longer diverting Colorado River water to the Salton Sea. So the level will, will decrease. We think by the year 2030, it will sink another 20 feet. So about three times faster uh, than it has been changing. And then it will stabilize again at around 255 feet below sea level at about the year 2030. So so the experiment that I'm going to uh, preview for you, uh, which has now been submitted to a, a journal, a scientific journal, tests what we think the effects of this shrinking salt and sea will be on air quality in the region. Okay, so it's a fairly simple, it's a fairly simple thought experiment that we're doing on a, on a large computer. So if this isn't something we're doing in our head, and I think this is the first time it's been done for the Salton Sea in such a comprehensive manner. The current outline of the Salton Sea that you see here has been shaded in green where we expect new playa to be exposed, so the new lake level will, will recede to the blue by the year 2030. So the test that, you're, uh, that, we, were, that we performed on computer asks, in this green area, now that it's going to become playa in the next few decades, we're going to allow dust emissions. We're going to allow the wind to pick up dust there. Uh, in this computer model, this, this uh, air quality model, and before it could only pick up dust from the surrounding regions that were not vegetated. So the model before had dust coming from where the wind was strongest, in these regions that had erodible desert soils. And now we've added this hypothetical new green area along the edges of this current Salton Sea as potential source regions. And we're going to ask, 
how much dirtier does the air get in the next few decades when we do that? Well, so these models need to be uh, sort of lovingly maintained, like a 65 Mustang that's been sitting in your garage. They were built for one thing, and you want to kind of tune them up for, uh, you know, for your own purpose. And our purpose is to ask this very question. It's a little um, like retrofitting. So we have developed a high-resolution database of soil erodibility. So kind of a mouthful, and maybe it's not interesting. Uh, the, the main reason I show this graph is to, is to remind you this is the study domain. So when I say at the end how much more particulate matter that you'll be breathing in the region, I'm referring to this domain. And uh, also of note are these labeled stations which show the current day air quality stations that we use to test uh, the accuracy of our model. So there are, there are actual measurements for a number of years at these stations. That number of years is relatively small for these five stations up here, which are the Borrego stations that Morgan will be talking about, because these just came online thanks to the Borrego Valley Endowment Fund about two years ago. And uh, the rest of the stations, though, are maintained by a combination of the Imperial Irrigation District, uh, the US EPA, and I think um, one or two Cal ARB uh, Air Resource Board stations. So those stations are, are all have been operating for longer. Uh, my background is actually in global dust modeling, things like the Aral Sea and Lake Chad and Africa, which are much bigger dust sources than anything around here. You don't want to live downwind of Lake Chad. <laughs> Although you can get real estate for fairly cheap. Uh, okay, so this is what that parameterization, which is in many global models uh, that I've been involved with, sort of looks like on a crude scale. And we can't use this for your local air quality. And so part of what we do is we use uh, scientific reasoning and theory to develop a higher quality, higher resolution erodibility map. And that's why I'm showing you this. This is actually what we're using in the model, not what would be used in a global scale, scale air quality model. And here are some results. So again, the black region is the Salton Sea. You can recognize its kidney-like shape. The red spots uh, are scaled in this graph in these units that we measure particulate air quality in. It's called PM10 for things that are smaller than 10 microns, particles smaller than 10 microns. That's about a tenth of the size of the diameter of a human hair. That's what the EPA uh, cares quite a bit about. Uh, and it's measured in micrograms per cubic meter. That's what those funny units mean. But the point is just the colors. On the southwestern side of the Salton Sea, we expect to see the largest increase in emissions from this newly exposed playa in the coming decades. That's what that red means. Okay? New emissions focused on the southwest corner of the Salton Sea. The right-hand panel shows some um, wind uh, arrows. These are the length of the arrow is proportional to the wind speed in meters per second, and so is the color. But the direction of the arrow shows the prevailing wind. I think this is for June, actually. Um, <clears throat> we were surprised by the fact that the southwestern side of the Salton Sea seems to be the most vulnerable uh, to new dust sources. We were surprised because, if you remember, a few slides ago. Most of the new area of exposed playa is actually on the southeastern side over here, right? But we're seeing most of the new emissions over here on the southwestern side. So this is the kind of non-intuitive uh, result. These are complex phenomena interacting. You have wind interacting with new soil, and then the direction of the wind carries that lofted dust into the atmosphere wherever that wind is blowing. 
And so we've, uh, we've identified that the newest sources are more likely to be on the southeastern side of the Salton Sea. That's what the left-hand panel shows. That was, a, that was an average figure for the month of June. So that's not something you would expect to see on any given day that was time averaged in our model for an entire month. But the model's running every uh, few minutes. We have what we call a time step. And so we're actually simulating individual dust events. And I wanted to show you a few of those dust events to give you a sense of how strong a new region can emit. And these regions here, again, in the southwestern uh, Salton Sea, and then some in the northern part of the Salton Sea up here in New Playa, can emit up to 10 times present day uh, amounts of dust in a few hours. So the previous figure showed that you get uh, a consistently uh, worse air quality, if you will, stronger emissions because of the newly exposed playa in the next few decades in the southwestern Salton Sea. These two figures show that on any given day, I think we have here, we use year 2016 winds because we don't know what the winds will be like in 30 years. So what we're doing is we're, we're, uh, we're repeating today's climatological winds. And uh, June 15th and, and June 27th were uh, very sort of strong and weak uh, dust emission days. The scales are very different. This is a weak dust emission day. If you look at the scale, that's a strong dust emission day. You can see a front of dust moving off the Salton Sea and being carried in a prevailing westerly out towards the eastern end of the valley. That's the kind of uh, power that these computer air quality models have. I'm going to sum up our findings are that relative to the year 2000, we think uh, by 2030, which is when the new lake level will stabilize, there will be about 40% more uh, ex uh, playa than currently. So in other words, think of the lake as shrinking by 40%, if you will. That uh, playa is more emissive in the southwestern part of the Salton Sea than the southeastern. When you look at the domain average, <clears throat> that big square box I showed you at the beginning, it goes down to Mexico and up past Mecca and to the left and to the right. That's the domain. Averaged over the domain for the entire year, about 10% more particulates. Right. Remember, I showed you some daily examples. Those particulates at any given time are concentrated near the new source regions mm -hmm. of the Salton Sea, right? Okay. So that's 10% more PM10. Those are the particles, the 10 micron particles that we're talking about. And in an, any given region uh, on the shore of the Salton Sea, on the newly exposed playa, there could be a considerable amount more of dust if that particular region is active that day. This has effects on, of course, uh, visibility. Uh, one of our other interests at UC Irvine is looking at the impact of these particulates not only on daytime visibility but nighttime visibility or night sky viewing which, which I've learned since coming here is uh, one of the uh, hallmarks of, of your park, of Anza Borrego State Park. It's a, I guess it became a, um, one of the three night sky reserves. Dark sky. Dark sky reserves, thank you. Uh, a few years ago. I know someone local was help, helped. Just uh, the last six months. The last six months? Yeah, from the park. But the, but okay. the community has been a dark sky community since oh, I see. 2009. Well, that's great, and we want to keep it that way. <laughs> These particles uh, scatter light, these, these PM10 sized particles that you breathe. When they stay in the atmosphere, they scatter light. That's one of the reasons you can see Los Angeles from so far away. If there weren't any particles in the atmosphere, the light would just go straight up and escape to space, most of it. And so you wouldn't be able to see Los Angeles until you were in it. But we see it from the side because it's scattered light by those aerosol particles. And so this 10% more uh, 
particulate matter in 20 or 30 years is going to have a nonlinear effect or a, an increased effect, a leveraged effect on the amount of light pollution in the valley. So that's something that we're beginning to uh, study as well. And I wanted to leave by pointing you to two resources that, mainly one resource. Uh, the left-hand side panel is a wonderful book by the Pacific Institute. They wrote um, a large report on the salt and sea and the cost of inaction by the state of California to uh, remediate the salt and sea problems. One on the right is just our manuscript that's been submitted and it's more technical and not light, not light reading. <laughs> That was not meant to be a pun, it's not about light, but it's... So, on the left-hand side, if you're interested in finding out more, I really highly recommend the Pacific Institute report on the future of uh, the Salton Sea region. And to remind you, uh, we will be back. Uh, first of all, Morgan will give a, a nice summary, summary of year two work. We'll be back uh, next year with our uh, results on identifying emission sources. And that's all I uh, came to say. Thank you. I thought we would take a few minutes for questions, if anybody had questions uh, for Charlie. It looks like. Okay, let's turn on the left, the gentleman with the beard. <laughs> yes. Uh, in a general non-medical way, could you relate your findings uh, to, uh, specifically to the Borrego Springs community vis-a-vis -vis health impact on humans? Okay, in a non-expert uh, non way is the only way I can uh, no, I'm asking talk about health. Because I'm a physicist. I understand. So, um, I'm going to let Morgan talk more about health and about levels of particulate matter to be concerned with. I will sort of uh, grease the wheels by giving you um, a sense of the numbers involved. Okay. And one, the, the federal government thinks that one should be, uh, never be exposed to amounts of particulate matter 10, PM10, that exceed about 150 micrograms per cubic meter regularly. If, if your community is experiencing that, they will try and help mitigate that. And the reason that the EPA uh, chooses 150 micrograms, it's, you know, there's no firm line, but 150 is known to have uh, health effects, especially for those predisposed with uh, weak uh, respiratory systems, um, asthma sufferers, and so when you're in an event that exceeds uh, that level of air quality, we, you don't want to be outside, especially if you're um, in a weakened condition. You have asthma. Uh, for, for certain types of pollution, that level is much higher than you would ever want to experience. Not necessarily for dust. One of the uh, constituents of what is in the air around here is certainly mineral dust or desert dust. And that's a relatively, normally a relatively benign uh, aerosol type or, or particle type in comparison to soot or black carbon, which is essentially the worst type of of uh, non-regulated particle that you could that you could inhale, and because soot is linked to cancer, and it's why diesel emissions are are highly regulated. So you're not necessarily uh, getting anywhere near that here in Borrego Springs because you don't have, for example, the kind of shipping port that we do in Long Beach, where where PM emissions uh, of soot from the ships offshore and all the trucks that come into port make that uh, one of the, I think it's actually this, the largest leading cause of excess deaths for uh, people over the age of 18 
in Los Angeles County is the harbor. And that's because of air pollution and it's because of soot. Okay. So I'm saying that in a reassuring way, I look out there, I'm not seeing a lot of semi-trucks and diesel activity and ships. Uh, I will qualify this with one note. Um, don't head for the alarms uh, yet, but the ply that's being exposed on the Salton Sea is laced with runoff from the agricultural region, and that runoff is full of pesticide. So this is why I'm largely interested in the, in the health impacts of, uh, of the dust that will be lofted into the atmosphere. And uh, you can look in this report that I showed, and they will talk about the number one and number two most dangerous things in that, uh, in that dust. And I won't go into that in more detail because it's kind of expert level. But um, yeah, it's the, it's the residual pesticides that are, um, I think, of concern. Thank Great you. question. I hope I didn't massacre the answer. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, let me get to the lady behind you and then to the gentleman from the press. So you're studying basically the dust coming off of the new sea and salt and sea, correct? That's what that study was, yes. So in your collection of dust particles with all your stations, doesn't the, the dust coming off the two off-roading parks that are to the, right to the west mm -hmm. of the Salton Sea change the accuracy of what you're studying coming off the Salton Sea? Because some of that dust makes this community white on weekends. So you have extra dust coming from those two parks right. so during the winter months normally. So this is an excellent example of what the study that I just mentioned doesn't look at at all. So we only added new sources, new sources around the, from the newly exposed salt and sea playa. That's all that I was showing. I wasn't showing anything from Ocotillo wells or off-road vehicle activities. That is in the air, and that is something that the stations around Borrego Springs can and do measure. And we don't look at the composition of the particles, but if it's different in color than other than dust on other days, that could easily be because there's more gypsum in it, and gypsum's white in color, and when that gets lofted into the atmosphere, it scatters light uh, with a white spectrum instead of a brownish or yellow spectrum. And that dust is part of the part of the measurements that Morgan's going to talk about. They do get mixed together in the atmosphere, uh, but I didn't mention any of that dust, and that's all part of the, of the reason that we're here, which is the Borrego Springs present day and, and, and near past air quality issues. So I don't know if that answered your question, but yes, they do mix together. Uh, we're aware of the source, the point source, and that's exactly one of the things that we will be, that source, uh, is one of the things we will be allowing to emit dust and then shutting off artificially in our model with real winds, with the observed winds, and seeing does the change in what the model suggests the air quality concentration is, does the change match the observations? If it does, that's how we fingerprint and attribute air quality issues to a specific location. Turning it off, oh, we don't, get, we don't match the observations anymore. Turning it on, oh, now the model matches the observations. So that's the method of attribution that we'll be using, but we haven't done it yet. Yes, thanks for your uh, patience. The, the, the question is on uh, persistence of the part particulates. Um, when the particulates are coming over here, or let's say it takes a day to get here yeah. and to be measured, what happens, do we know what happens to them? I'm mean, assuming no wind, does it settle? Does it rise? Does it disperse somewhere else? Do we have any way of measuring what is persistent left over in the ground that can be picked up again and blown in, you know, around? Okay, so that gets to the question of, of what we call resuspended particulates. Mm -hmm. We don't do a good job of understanding which particulates have already been in the atmosphere and then we lofted again. We just can't tell. 
So we are observationally constrained for these stations. The stations don't move. They're just stuck in the ground. And they're well maintained. Uh, but we can't tell where what they're measuring has come from. The way that we do that, uh, the way that we try to do that, is by looking at a second set of measurements from satellites. So we do have remote sensing available from satellites. Satellites are looking down and we uh, analyze those pictures. They get fuzzy when you get near ground level though. You can't pull great information out of satellites because dust is in a sense just dirt that's in the air so it looks a lot like the ground when you're looking at it from above. <laughs> so it's, it's a hard signal to noise problem is what I'm trying to say. So I don't have a good answer for it. I, my answer is that we don't know how much of it has already been suspended. Um, but generally, once the dust falls out, it needs a new wind event to be picked up. And it's, it's thought that the vast majority of dust in the atmosphere got there, and it's not resuspended because the physics of generating that dust doesn't really work in the uh, way that many people think. And uh, you need larger particles than the dust to actually inject the dust into the atmosphere. Dust doesn't blow itself into the atmosphere with wind. It's actually knocked into the atmosphere as large sand grains bounce along the surface in a process called saltation. And so the dust that you see wasn't picked up by wind per se, it was exploded into the atmosphere as a small particle, maybe a hundred micron particle, blew up when it hit the sand. It disaggregated and that jettisoned the smallest particles that make it into the atmosphere. So when those smallest particles that you see as dust land again, they're sticking too strongly to the ground to be lifted by air, wind. So resuspended part particulates are not generally an issue. Is there, do you know how much is left on the ground that, that, that persists? Well, all of it comes down again. It does sediment, like you suggested. And how yeah. much of it? All of it. I mean, eventually falls down. It takes. Uh, those particles of PM10 size between a day and two or three days to fall out of the atmosphere. Okay, yeah, so a few hours for the largest particles and uh, a few days for the smaller ones. Better move along? Yeah. Okay. Have one more question. Just one more from the back. Uh, so I just asked a question. We've been reading in the media that the very good spring seems to have the second worst air quality in San Diego County to do with the ozone in the air. And there's been a lot of press about it. Um, how is this? Why, why? Have you been doing research on this as well? Is it correct what they're saying? Or is it incorrect? It's very important to the town to know exactly what our air quality is. Well, I'm not going to give an answer that, that um, sounds, that, that makes, first of all, I don't know who uh, came out with the study that David pointed out to uh, Morgan and I in the San Diego Tribune yeah. uh, a few weeks ago about ozone, ozone levels in San Diego County. I did get a chance to look at the map. So I'm, I think I'm familiar with with some of the uh, evidence about ozone concentrations that you may be referring to. And I looked at the map and, and I don't understand why there would be an ozone source here in Borrego Springs. It did look, the map that I saw, like there was something local. Uh, and I don't have an explanation for what. Agriculture is by far uh, more important than industry in the local region, and agricultural sources for ozone are few and far between. We don't really have a source of NOx or NOx in the region that I know of. There's no shipping, 
<laughs> they also included water springs as well. Yeah, so, and I, I want to disclaim that <coughs> what we're looking at, uh, to clarify, what we're looking at today in terms of air quality is called particulate air quality. And your question relates to another kind of air quality, gas phase air quality. So ozone's a gas, and what we're talking about when we're looking at visible air quality is typically these particulates called aerosols. So it's a different field and one that atmospheric chemists think a lot about. And of course, in the uh, San Diego and LA basins, smog, photochemical smog and ozone is quite important. We know a lot about what forms it. And that's why I say to you, I don't understand how there could be a source of so much ozone here in Borrego. Um, it makes me wonder whether someone's extrapolated some data from a station that's on the other side of the mountains and just said, well, the political boundary of San Diego County goes out to the Salton Sea, so we're going to take the same levels that we saw and observed over there and just assume they're over here because they're doing some kind of mishmash of, of boundaries. I don't, I don't know why you would have high ozone here. You have sunlight, that's, that's an ingredient, but you don't have the precursor gases to form strong ozone concentrations, to my knowledge. If anyone knows otherwise, please come and, and speak afterwards. Is there a way that it could be found out? Um, because it, it's rather bad for the town. We're getting terrible publicity about this. And it isn't just the Union Tribune, it's been in other places as well. It's not good. It's a difficult question, you know, ozone, it's one of those invisible tracers. If ozone and carbon dioxide were actually black, <laughs> then we'd have the climate problem solved and we'd have the ozone problem solved because people would say, ah, oh, that's where the carbon dioxide is coming from and that's where the ozone is coming from, but they're invisible. So we need these Compl complex air quality models and the expertise of the chemistry to run them and what you're discussing is actually a whole nother project because it's gas phase chemistry that you need a complete emissions inventory for all the automobiles and um, and other emitters of <coughs> nitrogen and sulfur oxides that can lead to ozone and that's a that's a tough question my friend there's nothing at all to do with the sulfur could not be related. I don't see how. I don't see how the ozone source could have anything to do with the salt sea. It's just, we know it can be a source of of um, of sulfur oxides, but often we smell that. And if you're not smelling that, then I don't see how that we, could. We, could we do smell that occasionally coming from the salt and around the Salton Sea, the smell sometimes right. is incredibly high, very, right. very strong indeed. Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to be a, um, I don't want to be a killjoy because we're talking about it's really fun. I, I'm, in, I'm interested in this, but I want to let Morgan give her full uh, talk and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a possibility of uh, someone taking an interest in the air quality of ozone in this region, and if someone comes to my attention, I will encourage them to study that. But uh, right now, why don't we turn it over to Morgan? Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Charlie. And, and ladies and gentlemen, that was just the warm-up band. <laughs> the, the headline of it, uh, Morgan Gorris earned her undergraduate degree in Earth System Science and Engineering at the University of Michigan, and she's now a PhD candidate in the Department of Earth System Science at the University of California, Irvine, under the direction of uh, Dr. Zinder. Uh, Morgan has spearheaded this three-year program, and uh, so she's going to report on the year two results. Here we go, Morgan. I'm going to do a quick computer swap, so one second. So, thank you, Charlie, for setting up the scene nicely. Um, we're going to take it from the regional scale and kind of zoom in down on Borrego Springs now. 
Um, I'm going to be talking about the three-year study that Charlie and myself and, and some others are working on um, for evaluating particulate matter air quality here in Borrego Springs. So the majority of the talk today is going to be focused on year two of the study. Um, and I will do a quick recap um, on year one. So again, my name is, my name is Morgan Gorse. Um, and for the outline for today, I'm going to give you some motivation and background information about how this study came about and our goals. And recap you on year one, where we looked at historical air quality trends using some satellite data and some weather reanalysis data to see how uh, particulate matter has been changing. Um, over the last 20 years. And then I'm going to go into uh, year two of this study, which was really setting up the model that we're going to use to do the dust attribution. And then I'll show you some preliminary results from our new weather stations that are here scattered throughout Borrego Springs and what the particulate matter uh, quantities are from those. <coughs> and then I'll close with some conclusions and also talk to you guys about a citizen science um, opportunity. We have going on. So we know that dust is a pollutant. It causes uh, both environmental and human health concerns. Uh, we don't like it because it reduces our visibility. Um, but more so, it's also harmful for our health. Um, so it can cause respiratory infections. It induces asthma. And some of the particles are so small that when you breathe them in, they can actually get into your bloodstream. So local activities um, like tilling or the off-road vehicles um, may increase dust emissions and really for those reasons and for um, the citizens of Borrego um, who have experienced maybe the deteriorating air quality here, um, there's been concerns about the dust air quality here in Borrego Springs. So the Borrego Valley Endowment Fund was very generous to support this three-year air quality study, um, where in year one, we looked at the current state, um, historical variability, and trends in particulate matter air quality. Um, in year two, which is what I'm reporting on today, uh, we worked on developing our local dust transport model. It's actually going to model the local um, air quality conditions here and worked on tuning the model and picking the parameters that are best suited for our research question. And then next year, um, around this same time, I'll be giving a presentation um, on attributing the sources to the dust events. So we're gonna, like Charlie was describing, kind of turn on and off source emission areas and really see the main causes for the dust um, in this region. So Charlie and I have both been saying uh, particulate matter a lot, and that is the scientific name for the small particles in the atmosphere, such as dust. So it also includes soot, um, sea salt, and some sulfates and, and nitrates. So particulate matter um, is a pollutant that's enforced by the Environmental Protection Agency. So there are strict levels that an area needs to meet um, to be considered in compliance with air quality standards. And the EPA actually bins particulate matter into two different sizes. Um, so there are the large particles, um, we nickname them PM10, that's for particulate matter 10. And 10 stands for 10 microns in size. And then there's small particles, and these are PM2.5 or particles that are less than 2.5 microns in size. So to give you just an idea of how small these particles are, about 30 of the PM 2.5 particles will fit across the width of a human hair. So these are incredibly small particles. So in the first year of our study, uh, we looked at the current state and historical variability of air quality, in particular the particulate matter air quality here in Borrego Springs. And really what we found is that since year 1980, surface dust concentrations have been increasing in this region. Um, all dust sizes um, have been increasing by uh, under one uh, microgram per meter cubed 
and those small dust sizes have been increasing by a lesser amount, but nonetheless, this is a statistically significant increase in dust. And what we found was that winds accounted for about 50% about the, in the variance of uh, surface dust concentration, so they weren't explaining <coughs> all of the surface dust. And since winds are not increasing over time, this means that other factors are most likely responsible for this increase in dust. So moving into year two, we need to start to set up a way to actually measure where this dust may be coming from, originating from. So to do this, uh, we're setting up a model uh, to simulate the particulate matter transport in the Borrego Springs region. And the model that we're using is a type of numerical weather prediction model. So it's actually something you guys are probably all very familiar with because a lot of numerical weather prediction models get turned into the forecast that you see on TV by your local newscasters. So the model that we chose in particular is called the Weather Research and Forecasting Model. And this is a model that is used by operational meteorologists and it can be tailored to different research questions. So I really like Charlie's analogy about the Mustang. It's kind of the body of the Mustang and you get to put in the parts and decide you know, how fast you want your car to drive. We get to put in the parts and decide what exactly we want to model in our weather simulation. So the weather research and forecasting model is a, is a highly capable model that's used um, for operational weather forecasting and it's also capable of simulating uh, particulate matter transport. Um, it's a very computationally intensive model, um, so you can set it up on your personal computer, but it will take many hours to simulate. So we set it up on very powerful computers, um, and even something called a cluster, which you can think of almost 100 computers running at the same time solving the same problem. So, because we're looking at such fine scale uh, processes with lots of math equations, you need a lot of computational power. Um, so the model itself is very sensitive to the initial conditions that you provide it. Um, so you have to be very careful to pick your correct <coughs> domain, where you want to actually study, um, how big to make your grid boxes when you're saying, solve this math problem for you know, a square mile or five miles, um, and you need to really pick uh, conditions that are suitable to your individual research question, and that's a lot what year two is about. Um, it's also very sensitive to weather parameterization, so there's a lot of math that actually goes into weather forecasting, and there's many ways to simulate different processes, um, such as like clouds or rain, um, so this year we kind of turned on and off some of these processes to see which best suited our model. Um, and to just give you a fun example of what WORF can do, this is actually a hurricane simulation, so not related to, to our research, but just to kind of show off the capabilities of this model. Um, this is probably something you're familiar with, with looking on TV when hurricanes are coming. It's showing the radar reflectivity or the amount of rain that's happening in the storm. So this is the exact same simulation we're going to do. We're just going to zoom in on the Borrego area and turn on the particulate matter. So ultimately, this is what running the model looks like. Um, so we need a lot of input data to simulate weather. You can imagine basically we're trying to take this landscape out here, shove it into a computer, and get out realistic weather conditions. So we need to make sure we're adding in appropriate geographical data. Um, we're looking at the correct model resolution. Um, we include just about everything you could think of in terms of land surface, so um, how many leaves there are per per meter area, what the soil type is, what the soil moisture is, um, a lot of different types of geographical data. <coughs> and then we also need the initial conditions for our weather data. Um, so we need things like atmospheric pressure, uh, temperature, winds, and all that information um, gets fed into the model. 
where we pre-process the data to make our boundary conditions for our domain. So essentially, we have zoomed in on the Borrego area, um, and the model needs to know how to act on the outside of the model and within the model. Um, so we need to give it some initial conditions to start with. Then we run the WARF simulation, which again is uh, computationally very expensive, so it takes a while to run. And then we get the output, where then we plot and analyze the results. So I'm going to take you through some of the kind of initial conditions that we're using for our research question in particular, and show you an example of some output. So this is um, a graph of the dom domain that I chose. Um, the Borrego area is in the red box. It's in the center of the domain. Um, what's plotted in the background is the terrain height in meters. Um, so you can see Borrego's kind of in that a bowl shape of uh, higher terrain around it. And just uh, to the east is the Salton Sea again. So I made sure to choose um, a large enough area so that we're getting uh, dust sources from all around the Salton Sea, um, Akatia Wells, and even the surrounding areas so we can really pinpoint exactly where that dust is coming from. And this is just a fun example of some of those land processes that we need to put into the model. Um, so this is a map of land use categories. So we need to tell the model how to act over different types of land. Is it a uh, paved surface? Are there a lot of buildings there? So maybe the winds are gonna be slowed down. Is it a desert? So there's not a lot of, lot of vegetation, so the winds are gonna be sped up. So this is just an example of some of the input data that you have to put into the model. And this is one of the test case scenarios that I've chosen to look at. Um, this is from May of last year, um, spanning over four days. Um, you can see that in this, in this map, there's initial weather conditions. Specifically, I'm showing on the surface temperature and degrees Fahrenheit. So the darker the red, the warmer it is. And then very small, maybe you can't see in the back, there's wind barbs on there um, that show the general direction of the wind. So this is what the course weather data looks like going into the model. And I'm gonna quickly play it here and stop it at the first time step. So immediately, once we start running the model, you can see that a lot of the fine scale processes start to work themselves out and we're really starting to get the local scale weather. Um, so you saw that kind of the coarse temperature grid turn into a really fine <coughs> temperature grid um, even within the first six hours of the simulation. So this is an example of some of the output that we get from the WARF model and I'm going to play this movie and I didn't put Borrego or any distinguishing features on here because you're going to see something jump out that's really interesting. You're going to see temperature cycles, so you're going to see the day and night temperature cycles where it clearly gets hotter during the day and then it's cooling off at night. <coughs> and then for you closer folks, you might be able to see the flow, the wind flow in and out of the Salton Sea, which will pop up here in a second. So I'm going to give it a go. So it's cooling off at night, entering day two, getting warm again. And that very distinguishing feature of the Salton Sea is popping out. What are the time intervals between the scenes? This is six hours. Yes, good question. For those of us in the back who can't see the direction of the wind, could you comment on it? It's very scattered. <laughs> it's quite messy, to be honest. Yeah. So it is picking up. This is a one kilometer grid spacing um, in this model in particular. And you have a lot of noise here because we are picking up surface level winds. And in between all the canyons and the crevices, um, you have a lot of, a lot of noise. 
Um, around, I'm going to play this again. Around the Salton Sea, you can see a um, day breeze and a night breeze effect where when there's a temperature difference between the land and the water, um, the wind will flow um, from the warmer area to the uh, cooler area. So you're kind of, that's what I was talking about, about the wind flow in and out of the Salton Sea. You can see the wind's coming in and then the wind's pushing back out. So quite an incredible model to be able to turn um, the rather plain initial conditions seen here into those really fine scale local conditions. So then we need a way to really score our forecast and see how well it's performing. And one way that we're going to do that is by using the weather stations that are set up here within Borrego Springs. So there are approximately seven stations um, throughout Borrego Springs that are measuring wind. And wind is one of the outputs that we do get from the weather model. So if we take um, the station data and plot it against our point in the model, we can see how well the winds are performing. <coughs> And we care about the winds because that is the main driver of the dust processes. So on the first bar um, on top, you can see the raw station data that we're getting from one of our weather stations in black. Um, so this is 10 minute average data. Um, it's high resolution, um, but it's also quite variable because of that. And in red overlaid, is the wharf simulation for that station location. So overall, it's simulating the winds quite well at this station. Um, and if I take an hour smoothing function and look at the smooth winds over time for that station, you can see on the bottom plot there, it's performing quite well. So this is an encouraging sign that we are simulating the winds correctly um, in the atmosphere, and that is going to help drive the dust processes. So the next step um, is to take this um, model and start turning on and off the dust simulations. Um, I have done a few very short simulations um, because it's so computationally expensive. We're working on uh, moving it to a new, more powerful computer so that it doesn't take as long to run. Um, so next year is really going to be the punchline for where that dust is coming from and showing you kind of the same movie simulations and movement of dust. So an overview for a year two for our project, um, we compiled WARF, we got our frame for our Mustang and we put in all the right parts that we want to be there to start simulating dust. Uh, we went through and selected appropriate model parameters um, we ensured that they were the most fine resolution parameters that were being used in this high resolution model. And then we started quantifying our forecast skill and seeing how well we're actually representing those weather processes in our model. Um, and then I've chosen case studies um, that are showing different particulate matter air quality levels um, for, dust, for dust attribution studies in, in year three. And so the case studies that I've chosen um, all differ in their air quality levels. And also some of the simulations show deterior deteriorated air quality on one half of our stations, but not on the other. So we're seeing some of those fine scale, um, fine scale processes. And then also I got a lot of feedback recently about very poor air quality over the holiday season. And I'll get into that a little bit here, but this holiday season is going to be one of our test case studies because I've heard from a lot of folks that um, it was a bad time. So that'll be something we're, we're looking into. So I'm gonna switch from the model to actually talking about um, the state of air quality from the Borrego Springs weather stations that we have here in town. So this is a picture of uh, one of the weather stations that a Rude manages. 
and this is near Wilcox Well. And there's a lot of fun gadgets and gizmos on these stations. Um, everything from a lightning rod down to ground sensors actually dug in the soil uh, to measure soil moisture. Um, it's run by solar energy. Um, it transmits its data um, using an antenna. There's a wind anemometer at the top, a rain gauge. Um, we even have an awesome camera view, so when I'm at work, I get to <laughs> spy on Borrego Springs, see how your guys' air quality and, and weather is looking like. And these are set up throughout town. Um, there are seven stations, seven weather stations. Five of these stations are actually measuring particulate matter air quality. Three of these stations are measuring the large particles, PM10, and two of these stations are measuring the small particles, PM2.5. Actually, on your way out, if you look over yonder, there's actually a station here at the UCI um, Reserve. And this is just an example of what some of the raw data looks like from these sensors. So we are getting particulate matter air quality measurements every 10 minutes uh, from these sensors. Um, you can see some very short-lived events where you have those peaks in the data. Um, and you can see some longer-term events. Um, if you're curious about the holiday episode, it was right around here. Um, popping up in three of our stations. Um, this is the Wilcox Well station on bottom in purple. Uh, this is the elementary school station. Um, Wilcox Well is measuring the large particles. Elementary school is measuring the small particles. And the UCI re uh, research station is also measuring uh, the small particles. So you can see kind of the longer peak in uh, particulate matter there. And so what we really want to know is, are our stations exceeding um, the EPA standards? So the EPA standards are known as the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. And these are pollution criteria um, set as part of the Clean Air Act. And it covers six main pollutants, um, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, ozone, lead, sulfur dioxide, and then particulate matter, and that's split into those two categories, the large particles and the small particles. And there's two different levels of standards. One's more stringent than the others. Um, one's called the primary standards. This is to really protect human health, um, especially the sensitive populations. And then there's secondary standards, which is just for welfare protection. Um, those are a little, a little, uh, uh, more intense um, than the primary standards, which you'll see in the next in the next slide. So our five weather stations are named along the far left side there, um, and we have the two stations on top, the UCI base and the elementary school that are measuring the small particles. <coughs> and there are a few different standards for the small particles. So. We are not to exceed um, 12 micrograms per meters cubed of particulate matter um, for our primary standard. We're not to exceed 15 for our secondary standard. And those are both our annual mean that's averaged over three years. And then we can't exceed 35 micrograms per meters cubed for kind of our worst case scenario. So that's the 98th percentile readings averaged over three years. We can't be above 35 micrograms. So, so far for the UCI station, um, our annual mean, and we have about over a year and a half data, a year and a half of uh, data for all these stations now. Um, some stations we have a little bit more. Um, we're below these um, Standards, we're at 2.4 micrograms per meter cubed at the UCI station, and our 98th percentile is at 5.9 micrograms per meters cubed. The elementary school is also measuring small, small particles. They are a little bit higher at 3.8 micrograms per meters cubed, 
and 12.3 for the 98th percentile. So a little bit higher than what we're picking up here at the UCI station. And then for large particle sizes, or PM10, we have three stations that are measuring those, Wilcox Well, our Viking Ranch Station, and the Clark Lake uh, Dry Lake Bed. Um, and those cannot exceed 150 micrograms per meters cubed, and that's the daily average not to be exceeded more than once per year on average over three years. So it's uh, kind of a funny thing to calculate, um, but they do have to have these time averages in there. And as of right now, uh, we have zero days of exceedance at all three of our stations. Um, our maximum value at Wilcox Well was 42.2 micrograms per meters cubed. At Viking Ranch, it was 97.4 micrograms per meters cubed. And at Clark Lake, it was 29.2 micrograms per meters cubed. So as of right now, our stations are in compliance with EPA standards. However, that's not to say that we don't have periods of exceedance. Um, so the EPA has those time averaging um, restraints on their, their um, and at their uh, target levels, so we have to have uh, annual mean averaged over three years, um, daily average not to, ex not to be exceeded more than once per year. Um, but if we just look at kind of our raw data, there were brief periods of exceedance. So the daily averages that we had over 15 micrograms per meters cubed happened once, um, both at the UCI and the elementary schools, so they did they were above um, that exceedance level. And then if we look at the raw 10 minute average data um, at our three particulate matter 10 stations, Wilcox Well exceeded the 150 micrograms per meters cubed level four times, Viking Ranch exceeded it 148 times, and Clark Lake exceeded it 17 times. And these stations have been um, up and running, I think the longest has been up and running about two and a half years now. Right. Two and a half years now. So this is over the full time period that we have data. And so here are some of the pictures that I have been receiving um, from the public here, which are very helpful and do help describe what's happening. This is from Ms. Thompson. Um, she sent a few pictures in. Um, from an air quality episode over the holiday season. Uh, so this was a period where a lot of people reached out and said there was bad air quality. You can hardly see the mountains that are supposed to be in the background over on the right hand side of the image. And then I think this picture really captures it. Um, you can see the mountains fade, fade into the distance here. So. I looked at the raw data and I found that the holiday episode lasted from about December 29th to January 1st. So I grabbed the raw data from that time period and calculated those same averages just to compare against our average daily values. And they were higher at, at four of the stations. So our typical day, daily average for particulate matter at UCI station um, is 2.4 micrograms. Um, it was elevated at 3.8 micrograms. The elementary school actually dropped a little bit, but this is kind of in its natural variability range. Um, but Wilcox Well went up from about 3.4 to 13.9 micrograms per meters cubed. Viking Ranch was up from 5 to 9.7 micrograms per meters cubed, and Clark Lake was up from 3.6 to 18.2 micrograms per meters cubed. So that's not what they maxed out at. Um, that is the daily average. So there were definitely deteriorated qual air quality levels here. So um, between the pictures and some of this raw data, um, it's definitely going to be one of the case studies moving forward to pinpoint. Uh, where the dust was coming from. So just to recap our, your two results, um, 
We have the WARF model up and running uh, with the appropriate parameters for our research question. Uh, we added in some information specific to forecasting in Borrego Springs and started um, quantifying our forecast skill against the uh, local winds at our weather stations. And our, our stations don't currently exceed uh, EPA standards for particulate matter, um, but again, there were periods where we did go above those target levels. Um, but again, we have about a year and a half um, of data on average for the stations, um, and I think about two and a half years um, at most for some of our stations. So looking into the future for next year, um, I hope this kind of gave you a teaser to really come back and, and, and keep you on the edge of your seats. We're going to attribute the sources to these dust events um, and hopefully obtain some actionable information for you guys to step forward in planning. Um, we're also going to continue to monitor the particulate matter air quality um, with weather stations. And that can also be done with help from you. So last year we set up uh, a citizen science opportunity uh, to submit dust events. Um, so I have created a Google form. Um, it's very simple to fill out. I had a few people submit them to me over the course of this last year. And if you see bad air quality, I highly encourage you to submit a form. And this will help us to kind of pinpoint any further test cases that we want to look at. In the form, it's very simple. I ask for your name and email just so I can reach out to you if I have any further questions about like where exactly you were standing or what direction you were looking. Uh, the start date and the time of the event um, so I can see if what you're seeing is matching up with what our weather stations are seeing. Uh, end date and end time if, if it applies, uh, the location of where you think it's happening, um, and any additional information, there's a box there um, for you to fill out. I also put my email on the form, um, and if you would like to send me pictures, um, it's very helpful just to see what's happening and kind of see the level of the dust in the atmosphere. Um, so I put the direct link up here. It's very ugly. Um, this slide presentation will, meet, will be available um, online, and we'll get the word out to you where you can find uh, this dust form. Um, it's also available right now embedded on the Borrego Valley Endowment Fund page. Um, so if you can't find it, just search for it. Um, on the endowment fund page. Um, and also there's a link um, on my website. So if you find my website, uh, you can be sent there. So I'd like to say um, thank you. Um, I'm supported not only by um, a Department of Defense Fellowship, but also by the Borrego Valley Endowment Fund. Um, I think this is a, a critical study to be done um, in this area, especially with the looming air quality concerns in the future. I and mean, we'll leave my contact information up there. And thank you all for attending and, and being a part <coughs> of this work. If anybody has questions, uh, please uh, ask them. Morgan is more than willing to answer. Yeah. All right, we'll start on the right. Uh, do you have, can you share the location of the Viking Ranch? site and where it is located in relation to the uh, solar farm. Mm -hmm. I'm past it here. Okay. So you guys might be able to help me out a little bit with geography. This is Christmas Circle. That is the Viking Ranch site. Um, and I know we drove through a lot of date farms on the way up there. The citrus Cit groves. Sorry, citrus, citrus groves. groves. Viking um, Ranch is north of the uh, solar farm. Um, so it's, it's at the head of Borrego Valley Road, up up just above Henderson Canyon Road. This is Henderson Canyon, I believe. No, uh, no, no, no. That's D. D. Giorgio. Okay. That's D. Giorgio. Okay. Okay. Went on it for hot watch. Yes. Yes. Anything further? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm curious, what does the Department of Defense have uh, an interest in 
Um, your air quality oh, um, that's a great question. So um, I, I am funded um, as a graduate student by a Department of Defense um, uh, fellowship. Um, it actually is for some other research that I'm involved in. Um, I look at uh, some fungal diseases in the southwest of the United States as well. Um, so that, that was just a... Um, potential harm to human health, and, and the DOD is interested in that, so um, that funding uh, came through a grant. Any relation to the valley fever? I do study valley fever, oh. yes, okay. yes, so um, primarily um, some, some of my dissertation work is focused on uh, studying valley fever and how uh, disease incidence is modulated by climate. In Looking at the wind simulation model and dust simulation model, um, did you calculate some sort of index like an R squared to look at how much the variation is accounted for by the model? Yeah, like the variation in wind and other parameters. Right. Yes. Um, I, I'm sorry, I did not bring those numbers with me today, but we are calculating uh, statistical measures like root mean squared error to see how well the model's performing. Um, so not only do we visually look and make sure it's capturing those dust or wind events and dust events, but we actually um, do a uh, like a statistical quantitative. Okay, and calculation. were they statistically significant? Yes, but not for all of the cases. So sometimes there are scenarios where um, there will be smaller wind events that our model will miss. Um, sometimes our model will actually make wind events that don't exist that aren't being picked up here. Um, so there are some small discrepancies. Ultimately, it comes down to um, how long the simulation is and um, how many how many data points you're putting in uh, to calculate that. But overall, statistically, there's there's good agreement. Okay. Great question. Yeah, that's am, am I correct in assuming that any health impacts in the uh, Borrego Springs area uh, de de uh, is uh, determined in large measure by the source of the particulates which you will be studying in uh, year three? Um, so kind of what Charlie touched on, right, about the differences <coughs> between like mineral dust and right, soot? Yeah, like from the salt and sea as opposed to off the desert floor somewhere? Right, so the model itself does not um, discriminate against if it's soot or sea salt or mineral dust. Um, we help the model in initializing the conditions by telling it what those levels should be, um, but the model itself really gives out the total particulate matter um, level. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. When I go to the, the website, uh, airnow.gov, to look at air quality, mm -hmm. there is no monitor in the zipper. And mm -hmm. so there's some kind of an average, you get something. Does everybody look at that for the air quality? Is there anything we can do to get better information about our air quality here? Or what else can we do? That's a great question. Um, so actually, um, David Garman and I have been working on a plan to get some kind of two-week, bi-weekly data available and hopefully made available possibly through the Borrego Sun of actually turning our stations here in town into one of those forecasts. So um, so the website she's talking about is a EPA website. It's called Air Now. Um, and you can get a categorical uh, forecast value for your air quality. So um, categories are uh, good, uh, moderates, um, I know dangerous, and, and then off the charts is one of them. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to average the weather station um, data in our, in our town and then turn that into one of those categorical values, and then that information will be available here, but in retrospect. Right. So it's, we, our, our stations can't forecast, and they can only measure. Um, so hopefully, what it can do for you guys is give you a sense of, oh yeah, it was bad this weekend. Oh yeah, it said it was moderate this weekend. Okay, now I know what moderate looks like. You know, now I know what to anticipate. So you can take, you know, personal precautions for your individual health. 
Yeah. Otherwise, EPA now, it really, it really makes that data um, off of their stations. Um, they're very particular about what type of measurements they do and how they calibrate it and stuff. So we won't be able to get, unless the EPA implements their own station here, um, that's the best data we're working with. Yeah. Is that, you think that's even a possibility? We can show that it's different enough here that they need to have a station. Yeah, th yeah, that's absolutely a possibility. If we can give them convincing evidence that there may be a air quality problem there, um, they may be willing to put one up. Yes. So something that we're working on is calibrating our weather stations with um, other measurements uh, to make sure that we're getting the correct values to report um, to these to these agencies. So that could be an actionable item in year three. Yes, exactly. That is the actionable kind of information that we want to end up with next year. Could you put it back to the context slide, please? Oh, 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 oh that one. This okay. one? This one? That's good, too. Okay. I, I do that. Any other question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. With what's happening with the salt and sea, we're going to yeah. have this drop in level which you're projecting to be how many feet it is in the next coming um, 10 years. Are you going to be projecting forward of how the, the bad air quality is going to increase vis-a-vis -vis what is happening in the salt and sea? No, our model is not capable, well, no, not in the scope of my project. Our model, as it currently stands, um, needs some work to be made capable to do that. It, it can be done, um, but as it currently stands, no. That's kind of a, a different research question um, that takes into account um, other environmental change factors. Um, yeah. Okay, but everybody's fully aware that this salt and sea is a huge problem. Yes. And in the near future, I don't think it's going to be resolved. So we're going to hit those targets where you're going to have much more exposure there to this toxic material. And is that going to increase over the next, you know, how is it going to increase over the next 10 years? When is it really going to badly affect us here? And I, I would think it's rather important to know that to put pressure on people to do something that's all awesome too. I completely agree, and I think it's a huge avenue for research in the future. Do you have anything you want to mention about that, Charlie? Yeah, we're all in agreement on, on that point. Yeah. It's, be, it's such a big issue that it is beyond the scope of Morgan's current PhD research, and I'm actively recruiting for us a student or postdoc right now to take the mantle of the larger scale salt and sea issue and continue to hammer on it until we can get some action from the state. This is exactly the kind of integrated environmental quality problem that, that I hope our department focuses on more and more. And this is, we've heard why we need both air quality and we need to bring in biologists to understand how the lake acidity transforms with different populations of fish and invertebrates in the salt and sea because that will affect sulfur emissions. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a knotty problem. And there are others that you see are on, including um, Travis Huxman mm -hmm. and Tim Bradley in the biology department who are just as gung-ho as we are, but finding the resources for that is not easily done because it's the kind of thing that the state want to hear about. <coughs> but at the moment, there is sort of some air quality research being done in the sort of isn't there? You're not doing that, are you? We are not. There, there is some uh, an Imperial Irrigation District funded research. Yes. It's uh, looking more at mitigation techniques. How can they cover the topsoil? How can they stabilize new sources? I there are undoubtedly uh, issues that I haven't heard about that they're researching, but yes, there are other institutions would there, involved. Would there be a correlation between what they're doing 
and the increase in the position there of the air to the increase here. Are you asking if their field work is causing some of the pollution that you're seeing here? No, I'm not saying the field work, but I'm no. just saying as the salt and sea basically is drying up, that they're deteriorating, they're having increase in their pollution over there. Oh, yeah. Does that correlate to the increase in pollution here? Almost certainly, but the, the key is what's the strength of that correlation? Is it, are the prevailing winds generally carrying it elsewhere? Or are you seeing one for one what they're seeing over there? And that's the kind of issue that we don't have an answer for, but I suspect that you're seeing a good uh, chunk of what they're seeing over there as secondary effects over here. It's all tied together. But you would not work together with them, or sort of uh, put your finding, match them up, to see what is going to happen. No, I wouldn't say that. We would certainly collaborate if we had the resources to have someone pay attention to both sets of findings. Yeah. Yeah. A unified project on the salt and sea is really what I think the mandate is for the Salton Sea Authority, which is a USGS-led effort to unify the 20 or so agencies that have a stake in the Salton Sea. Um, but they are, they are broke. There's one person. He is the Salton Sea Authority. <laughs> and his, his task is, is, is enormous. And so, uh, the, the geologist, I don't oh, remember his name. Let, let's take one more question. Diana, I, I think um, you had a question. Yeah, with the ozone thing, if, if the ozone were blowing down this huge canyon system we have at the northwest here, Coyote Creek, from Riverside County, would your model pick that up? No. Not our model, but uh, uh, an, an air quality model with gas phase chemistry would pick that up. Right. And yes. so we're not running the gas phase chemistry component of the air quality model. Is, I'm sorry, is someone running it? Did you say? No. So no, typically I'm, those no. things are run for the LA basin and they kind of stop at Riverside yeah. because right. that's where the population boundary falls off the cliff. So, uh, yeah. uh, it's certainly, it's trackable, but no one, to my knowledge, is, is doing that. Great. I, I want to thank everybody for coming today. I think this is something that we can probably talk about for several more hours, and if anybody is interested in uh, uh, hanging out and uh, chatting about this uh, more, please do. Uh, I w also want to, before we stop, just uh, emphasize the citizen science component that uh, Morgan was talking about and the opportunity that each one of us has uh, to contribute to this study. Uh, just Google Borrego Valley Endowment Fund and you, can, you will find the uh, dust form that Morgan is talking about and, uh, and, and so you can contribute to that uh, in this way. Uh, while you're at the Brago Valley Endowment Fund site, if you care to sign up for the newsletter, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Um, and I guess with that, let's give a round of applause to Charlie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody for coming. Thanks.